my name is uh, Barry Schrag. I'm uh, president of uh, Combined Jewish Philanthropies. I, um, I just came back uh, from Israel, and one of the things that I can tell you is that one of the things that you should do is to plan a trip to Israel as soon as possible. You go to Israel and you think, you know, what do they need you there for in the middle of everything that's going on and everything they've got to deal with? But I'll tell you, there wasn't a single Israeli that didn't tell me how proud that they were that we were there, how important it is to have American Jews come, and, 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 and this was the really horrible part, how, how brave they thought we were for, for being there. And I thought, that's, that's not right. That's not right. They're, they're there every day, day in and day out, trying to deal and survive with what they have to do. And, and uh, our, what we do in, in that sense is really so small, and yet it's so uh, uh, deeply appreciated by the, by the people of Israel. It, um, time moves so fast, and things happen so quickly. So three weeks ago, I was in Israel with the governor celebrating Startup Nation and seeing companies so glad to be there because Israel is the heart of technology for the whole world. And two weeks ago, we got together to mourn the deaths of four teenagers. And there were no, no applause, no cheers, no smiles, just tears. Just tears at the death of human beings in a very, very bad neighborhood, in a very, very difficult world. And so it wasn't with joy that I went back to Israel at this time. It was really to understand what was happening in Israel. America is a blessed and lucky place. We haven't had real battles on our soil since the Civil War. We don't understand what it's like to wake up to sirens in the middle of the night. We don't really understand what it's like to send, send our sons and daughters off to war. And now this is a desperate time, a desperate time. I can tell you that the last thing in the world that the prime minister wanted to do was to send Israeli soldiers off to war, a war that will take many of their young and promising and wonderful lives, a tragedy that no one really wanted. So why did it happen? Why is this happening? Today, Hamas violated its own humanitarian ceasefire. How can that be? What does that mean? It's not hard to understand what it means. I urge you to Google the Hamas charter. You'll see very clearly what it means. It means that their aim is the destruction of the state of Israel, which they consider to be a holy goal on their part. This is not Islam against the world. It's not Islam against Israel or against the Jews. It's a terrorist organization, Hamas. It is not a country. It is not a faith in and of itself. It has its own goals and they're very, very clear. And you know, if there's one thing we understand as Jews that we must understand, it's when they say they're coming to kill you, they are coming to kill you. And there's no doubt about it. And here we are in this situation. So I went to Israel to see just a little bit about what it's like. And in Tel Aviv, it's quite right, you, it's survivable. You can get through it. We went down to the bomb shelters during one red alert and there was a technology conference going on. They interrupted their technology conference for about 15 minutes to be sure that they weren't harmed by the, by the rockets that were coming. But when you go down south, when you go to Sterot, Sterot is the canary in the coal mine. Sterot is where life begins and ends in Israel. It's a dusty, poor, impoverished town that's faced rocket fire virtually nonstop for 14 years. It's unbearable what those people actually went through. So we visited the home of a, a family uh, appropriately named the Cohens. Um, a, a, a mother, a father, and their eight children, and all their neighbors came down to talk to me as well. And their story was amazing, because the Cohens left Efrat to come to Sterot 
because they wanted diversity for their children, religious diversity, socioeconomic diversity, deeply committed to being in steroid. And while we were there talking, the sirens went off and we went into the safe room, all of us, about 15 of us, not a big room. And we stayed there until, the, until we felt it was safe to come out and we were very confident because we believed in the Iron Dome. And the Iron Dome is a magnificent, magnificent thing. And so I heard three huge booms that shook the building. This is not something that children ever, ever, ever get used to. Your children would never get used to it. It traumatizes forever. It's a Boston Marathon terror siege every single day that these folks have to somehow figure out how to deal with. But we were confident in the Iron Dome. So it was a bit of a shock the next day when I went back to Sterot. And I saw the damage that 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 rocket had actually caused in the middle of a residential neighborhood in Sterot. So Iron Dome is 95% effective. It's not comforting if you're in the 5% range, not the least bit comforting. And if you want to know why the ceasefire never happened, it's because Israel asked for just one thing, that new rockets be forbidden from coming in, that the borders be sealed so that no new armaments could come in, because guess what? If bigger rockets come into, that, in, into, into Gaza, Iron Dome will not be effective. And that's what you really have to think about. How dare they? Every single day, the media takes great pride in saying that 200 people have died, 215 people have died, 230 people have died, and not a single person died in Israel, as if that's some kind of tragedy. Well, let me say that 230 people dying is a huge tragedy. Every child's death is a tragedy that cries out to God. But you need to consider what would happen and what the goal of Hamas was. Those 230 people did not die because Israel wanted them to die. There is not a single Israeli soldier that doesn't cry all night over every soul that's lost. They died because they were placed in harm's way by their own people to provide cover for missile launchers and for instruments of death aimed at, aimed at Israel. So you can imagine what would happen if the 1,100 rockets actually landed in Israel, if there was no Iron Dome. That is the intent of Hamas. That's why they couldn't sign the ceasefire, because they need new weapons to enter their territory so that in some future war they can once again be used against Israel. There's a, a wonderful man, his name is uh, Ari Sacher. He's one of the uh, chief engineers on the uh, Iron Dome. And he said, uh, you know, one of the real problems with Iron Dome is that there are no fatalities to show the world in Iron Dome. There are no pictures of destroyed buildings. So he actually created a computer program that would track every rocket as if it had hit something in Israel and show what the destruction would look like. Tel Aviv in flames, Sterot utterly destroyed, Beersheba never to be raised again in the future of the world, all of those places utterly destroyed. That's not an accident. That would have been on purpose. That would have been their aim, part of their aim toward the destruction of the state of Israel. So Israel is defending itself. This is not a time of joy. Those soldiers inside inside Gaza right now are deeply in harm's way. And I can tell you something for sure, they will do everything humanly possible to avoid civilian casualties. They will do their best to carry out their jobs and come home and be able to sleep at night because they know they knew that they had defended their country without inflicting harm on a single human being. That is the aim of the state of Israel. So Sterot is the canary in the coal mine for the state of Israel, the whole country. If we let it go, everything goes. It's the thread that's sticking out, and if you tug on that thread, the whole tapestry will be destroyed. Those rockets are aimed at accomplishing that. When the Cohn family leaves Sterot in terror, that's the beginning of the end for Israel. 
And when that happens, it's the beginning of the end for the West. It is in all of our interest to remember that terror must be stopped. It is not amenable to negotiation. It is based on an imperative of destruction. And as part of the West and as part for, in, in the name of our love for Israel, we simply can't let that happen. So look, um, we measure ourselves by our love for humanity and for the love of our people. And right now we have no choice. Just as the soldiers of Israel are entering Gaza in our own very tiny way, every single one of us must be a soldier in the struggle to tell Israel's story to the world. As As Jeff so rightly said, this is an absurdity. I, I wonder if you heard on the news this morning that a, a count of the number of Shiites who had been killed by Sunni just yesterday, or Sunnis killed by Shiites, or the number of people killed in any of the multiple wars that are now destroying a part of the world. You heard nothing of that. Somehow we must tell the truth. We are not there to end anybody's life. We are there to defend the state of Israel, and we here are here to tell the truth to the world. That is our imperative. We will not be remembered well by future generations if we fail in our responsibility. Thank you.